I'd like to invite the, uh, the session uh, presenters today up to the stage. Uh, for, but uh, it's an exciting group of uh, presentations, diagnosis of IPF, and, and certainly we uh, understand the, uh, the journey that some of us have undergone or experienced, so it's an important and evolving field, which is the excitement and expanding it to even um, uh, earlier stages of diagnosis, which is important for uh, relatively um, obvious reasons. But to uh, start off the presentation, as, as we've experienced yesterday, we actually have um, the first presentation is one of the uh, excellent poster uh, discussants uh, who was identified. And um, I'd like to introduce Lita Harari, who's going to speak on endobronchial optical coherence tomography for low-risk microscopic assessment and diagnosis of IPF. Um, she is uh, um, an investigator from Massachusetts General Hospital, and so I'd like to welcome her and congratulate her on her excellent uh, poster that's been identified for her discussion. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So um, thank you guys so much. It's really an honor to be here and to have my poster selected. Um, and before I get started, I'm actually a lung pathologist. So I'm one of the black sheep of the room. Um, and you know, of course, as a pathologist, I don't see patients, um, which although many of my aspects of my job are awesome, that's one of the parts that kind of sucks for me. So whenever I come to academic meetings, you know, I think this is a common experience for a lot of us. We always leave feeling energized and excited and ready to hit the ground running. But I don't think I've ever felt quite as energized as I have after this summit. I mean, it's just been such an honor to be able to interact with the patients one-on-one, -on -one, to have them come to my poster and ask me questions about the work I'm doing and why they think it's important or, you know, them giving me feedback. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you um, for such a wonderful event. So what I'm going to be talking about this morning is um, using a new imaging technology um, as a potential method for diagnosis in IPF and other ILDs. And so we've been talking about IPF for two and a half days now. And we all know that the diagnosis is important and it always has been prognostically. But in the last five years, it's become even more important therapeutically for strategization to determine who's going to get immunosuppression and who's a candidate for antiprobiotic therapies. But as we've also been talking a lot about, the diagnosis can be really complicated. And one of the big bugaboos in this diagnosis is in HRCT, although it does a magnificent job identifying a lot of patients, there's this ever-increasing cohort of possible, probable UIP and really the thing that's missing most often is honeycomb. And there's a couple of reasons that have been proposed in the literature for that. One is that microscopic honeycomb can be small. And if it's around two to three millimeters or below, it just sits on the resolution limitations of CT. Number two is that it's really difficult sometimes to distinguish honeycomb change from cystic airways known as traction bronchiectasis. And even though we see traction in UIP, IPF, we also know we see it in a lot of other diseases. And where do you decide is the line between how much traction without honeycomb is UIP and what's a completely different disease process altogether? And so to compound the diagnostic problem is that when CT is not definitive, the current guidelines require that a patient have a microscopic diagnosis in order to establish the patient has UIP, IPF. And as we all know, this is a risky procedure. You know, surgery is invasive, patients under general, reasonably sized pieces of tissue are being taken out, and there's worries about morbidity and also mortality, which really limits some patients from even being able to undergo such a procedure. So we end up in a conundrum. And so I think the bottom line is, is as it stands now, there's really no currently available method that can do microscopic assessment that's low risk and doesn't require tissue removal. And so in my graduate work, um, I had focused on a technology that's called optical coherence tomography. And this is a technique that's really similar to ultrasound, except you use light as your source instead of sound. And what this provides you is much higher resolution, so on the order of 10 microns, but of course you're limited in penetration depth to about maybe three millimeters or so. And so this is a really nice application for surface imaging on the skin and also for um, endoscopic imaging, as we'll discuss in just a few moments. 
Some of the real benefits of the technology is you don't need a contrast agent, you don't need a transducing medium, it's just light, and so in fact one of the biggest, you know, clinical application successes we've had is to apply this technology to retinal imaging. So when you go to your eye doctor, it's very likely that when you go to get your retina assessed, you're using the OCT technology to do that. And so one of the other huge benefits of this technology is it's very catheter compatible. And we're able to make catheters that are very thin in size that are able to then interrogate places like the GI tract, the cardiovascular tract, and now more recently also um, the pulmonary tract. And another big benefit of this technology, oops, well that didn't work quite like I was hoping. Oh, there it goes, yay. Um, one of the other big benefits of the technology is that it's able to acquire data at incredibly rapid rates, even faster than video rate. So you're able to generate pullbacks of microarchitectural data in seconds, so tens of centimeters in under 30 seconds. And so this is an example from a lung cancer patient that we had interrogated where you're able to visualize on the left here a cross-sectional image and then also re-slice it in the XZ and the YZ over multiple centimeters to really get an assessment of the microarchitecture of the tissue. And so this gives us the capability to be able to image tissue volumes that are much larger than we get in a standard wedge from an ILD biopsy. So in the clinical studies that we've been conducting, um, we've been able to interrogate patients and what we had noticed is that our catheter, although a large diameter of 1.6 millimeters, actually accesses the peripheral lung pretty readily. And so you can see that here in this image on the bottom where on the very top panel we have a long multi-centimeter pullback. And then this is the distal aspect here on the very left and it's moving more proximally towards the right. And then if you look on the bottom left and the center, what you're seeing is a distal bronchiole. And in the center, the black is the catheter. You can see just beyond that, the epithelium pointed out by the E. And then beyond that are these black, small, signal void alveoli with thin alveolar walls. So not only are we able to reach the peripheral lung, but we're also able to visualize really high detail. So that was very encouraging to us. So we started to ask ourselves that if we can access the peripheral lung, can we use this technology to interrogate peripheral lung diseases like interstitial lung disease? And so if this were to be successful, the way we would imagine it working is to be folded into sort of the standard clinical practice for diagnostics, where patients who had an HRCT, if they're definitive IPF, they're done, questions answered, they've got their diagnosis. But for this ever-growing population of possible probable IPF, what if instead of going to wedge, you were able to take the patient for a conscious sedation bronchoscopy for a 10 to 20 minute procedure, and then at that standpoint, if you were able to decide definitive IPF, the patient would be done and would never need a surgery. If you were able to say not IPF, still possible, you could avoid the surgery. And it'd only be the patients who did, still didn't have a diagnosis that would then be required to undergo a surgical biopsy if possible. And so when starting to look at this, we really wanted to look at, okay, well, what are the architectural features we look for from a pathologic standpoint so we know what to look for in the imaging? And so, of course, first and foremost in IPF is this characteristic subpleural fibrosis where you lose your alveolated parenchyma and replace it with destructive fibrosis. So we're going to look for that. Number two is that there should be spatial heterogeneity where some regions are fibrotic and other regions nearby are not. So there should be regions of preserved alveoli. There should also be honeycomb change where we see these cystic multilayered structures embedded within the fibrosis. And then finally, the last diagnostic criteria is to look for fibroblastic foci as an indicator of active disease as well as established. Now, as we've talked about already, it's really this honeycomb change that's the sticking point in a definitive versus possible probable UIP by HRCT. So really our focus has been mainly there. And although fibroblastic foci are important, they're not part of the diagnostic criteria for HRCT, and they're not specific to UIP. So we've decided for the time being we'll put a pin in it and we'll come back to it from the imaging perspective at a later date to see if it's necessary or not. 
So the first study we did um, was to take ex vivo samples from patients who had ILD, and this included wedge biopsies, lung explants from patients undergoing transplants, a few autopsy specimens, and we conducted OCT through the airways and matched the imaging one-to-one -one with histology so we could start to build a database of what that imaging looked like. And so what we found, this was an example from an IPF patient, is in this image what you'll notice is that outside the catheter we still have a thin epithelium, but beyond that we've lost all of the alveoli that should be there. And what's replaced it is this dense, homogeneous, gray-looking tissue. And then within the box, you can see that there are these large, irregular, layered cysts, which kind of resemble honeycomb. But we wanted to be sure. So we matched against histology, and what we found was that that disorganized gray tissue was fibrosis, and the cysts embedded were actually submillimeter honeycomb cysts. So we've done this in a number of specimens, and we found that we're able to fairly reliably identify these features that we're looking for in UIP, and we don't see them in the non-UIP ILDs. And so we also in this were able to identify spatial heterogeneity as well. So we met all the criteria that we were setting out to look for. From here we developed some preliminary OCT criteria that we then moved on to apply to in vivo patients. And so what we're working on now is conducting a pilot study where we're specifically focusing on patients who have ILD but a non-diagnostic HRCT and they're undergoing a surgical wedge, and we perform bronchoscopy with OCT immediately prior to the wedge. We're aiming for 30 patients in the initial pilot, and we've done 11 to date, so we're about a third of the way there. And so how we perform this is we go over with the bronchoscopist prior to the procedure, where are the sites on HRCT that look abnormal? Where is there likely to be potentially honeycomb change that just isn't visible on the HRCT? And so we plan out where we're going to image, and we typically do about five to six sites. Each sites have long pullbacks, and we've set a maximum imaging time of 10 minutes. So we cannot take more than 10 minutes to collect all of our data. And then we finally compare what we decide diagnostically, the OCT images, what the patient has, and then independently compare with the surgical lung biopsy. And so this was our very first patient that we imaged. So he's a 56-year-old gentleman, four-month history of dyspnea, and what you can see is he has the classic probable UIP pattern where there's basal or predominant reticular opacities, there's a little bit of traction, but no clear honeycomb. So it was read as suggestive of fibrosing NSIP, maybe early UIP. What we saw in the bronchoscopic OCT images was that there were regions where you had completely lost the alveolated parenchyma, replaced it with fibrosis, and then embedded with that are these multi-layered, very irregular cystic structures that seem consistent with honeycomb change. What was also really interesting is that there were areas where by the red arrow we would see these cystic structures, but they were always separated from the main airway by a layer of epithelium. So they weren't necessarily branch points. But then there were other cysts where when we looked at the 3D reconstruction through the scan, some places it looked like a cyst, but then when you scanned back and forth, you realized, oh, that's just a cystic branch point. That's probably traction bronchiectasis. We also were able to identify spatial heterogeneity in this patient, and we ended up deciding, in fact, intraoperatively, that this looked like UIP. And the pathology agreed with that and confirmed all of the findings that we found by OCT, and we were able to make the diagnosis in this patient with a total imaging time of actually less than six minutes. So we beat our max of 10 minutes. Second patient we had was a perfect contrast to this. And so this was a patient whose 52-year-old woman had, again, reticular abnormalities that were fairly basal or predominant. And the radiologist, who was a thoracic radiologist who read this, thought that these cystic structures here could be honeycomb change and was leaning more towards this being a definitive UIP. The pulmonologist wasn't quite convinced and said, no, I, I want a biopsy. I'm not sure that that's honeycomb. So when we took the patient for imaging, what we found was that there were cystic structures, but they were always branch points off of the main airway. There was never any isolated cyst. And even more importantly, in the peripheral lung, there was never destructive fibrosis where you lost alveoli. Instead, what you had were individual, evenly spaced alveoli, but there's clearly abnormality here because there's fibrosis in between those alveolar walls and surrounding the airway. 
So based on the imaging we saw over five to six centimeters, so centimeters worth of data that we acquired on this woman, we said none of this looks like a UIP. And this probably is an airway-centered fibrosis question, chronic hypersensitivity. And the final path agreed with that really nicely. And so what you can see here is this is the pleural surface and there's actually subpleural sparing. And then below that is an airway which has mixed fibrosis and inflammation and then adjacent is interstitial thickening in the alveolar walls. And so it was favored pathologically that this may be a chronic HP. So we've done 11 patients and analyzed eight patients to date, and so far our concordance has been really high. Um, we've just had one patient who had an indeterminate lung biopsy where it just, we weren't able to come up with an agreement. We even had the infamous Tom Colby look at the slides and he said, I think it's UIP, but it doesn't quite have enough honeycomb. And just to show you what that case looked like, so here's the CT, it's classic CT, and what we saw by imaging was regions that had really clear, to us, honeycomb change, and a little bit, you know, here's a bronchiole here, it's not quite traction bronchiectasis, but there's multi-layered cysts that we saw. In the matched path, almost all the criteria were met. It was destructive peripheral fibrosis, spatial heterogeneity, numerous fibroblastic foci, but the honeycomb piece was missing. So we don't know in this case, was it a sampling error or not? So we're gonna follow this patient and patients like this um, to determine how they ultimately turn out to progress. So in conclusion, we've developed catheters that can access the peripheral lung. We've successfully conducted imaging in ILD patients and imaged much larger volumes than the wedge. We've shown that we've preliminarily been able to identify features of IPF, including microscopic honeycombing. We've also shown that OCT has a lot of potential for differentiating traction from true honeycomb, and we'll be really interested to follow that up. And then finally, what we thought was really important is that it seems like the features we're seeing by the imaging are paralleling quite nicely what we get on the wedge, which we think is important. So in moving forward, we think there's a lot of potential for clinical impact. Um, obviously, from a diagnostic perspective, it would be great to have a low-risk bronch instead of an invasive surgery. But we also think there may be potential that if, if it is true that we can reliably identify microscopic honeycomb, maybe we can identify who are UIP patients a little bit earlier, start treating them a little bit earlier. And then finally, I think what we're the most excited about is not only could we use this for diagnosis, but could we potentially apply this to follow patients over time and look at changes in their disease with natural history for patients who are off drug or changes that are occurring therapeutically in response to current antifibrotics or in the phase three clinical trials as well. So thank you so much. I'd just like to acknowledge everyone who's been helping in this work and thank you for listening. <laughs>